LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, glad to have you on board. I hope you've had a great week. Uh, I am actually recording a little bit early this week, so I'm actually recording on a Thursday. So uh, tomorrow I'm looking forward to going out. We're going to be looking to install a beaver pipe. So uh, looking forward to that opportunity and get a little bit of uh, experience and knowledge in that particular area. I'm hoping to do some filming of it, so maybe I won't, maybe not out in the muck and mire too too much but uh you know with beaver areas it, it can be wet pretty much everywhere so nevertheless i'm looking forward to this particular opportunity doing some uh, pigeon trapping right now and so i'm kind of enjoying that and getting uh you know learning we're relearning how to how to trap pigeons again so just for those of you who don't who think i just sit behind a microphone or in front of a screen all day long uh not true i actually do get out from time to time to get out and do some field work and get some uh, experience uh it's helping me um be a better educator and to do some training and sometimes i even do a little bit of research testing out new ideas and so nevertheless enough about me do take a few moments of your time if you would to subscribe to the channel ring the bell uh to make sure that you're notified of all new uh, episodes of this particular podcast also uh we would love to get feedback from you you can reach me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com that's wildlife control consultant at gmail.com would love to hear from you send me your complaints trials questions i'm also available for consultation and doing some ghost writing for you looking over uh things and so you may want to have some items written up for you because you may be able to go out and make more money doing something else rather than sitting behind a computer doing writing I also do uh, watermarking of photos as well. So if you have a batch of photos that you would like to have watermarked so that uh, it's harder for people to steal them on the web. I know I've had photos of mine uh, taken and used on websites without my uh, permission. Um, and again, all people have to do is ask. I'm not expensive at all. And of course, as you all know, I hope by now, if you've been listening to this podcast for any length of time, I would love, to, I'm always looking to buy use rights of photos. I am particularly keen on getting rodent photos right now, particularly Norway rat issues and roof rat issues, uh, and I guess house mouse as well. Uh, those those three species I'd be particularly interested in. Again, I'm not buying the ownership of the Im images. In other words, you're still able to sell them to other people. I'm just buying the rights to use the photo. And of course, credit is given. So with one person that I've bought purchased from, I put their name <clears throat> or whatever name or company that they wanted on the photo itself so that no matter where I used it, they would always be sure to get credit. Although I usually put a a note underneath it as well when I'm doing my presentations or using in the publication. So if you're looking to make some money, Christmas is coming up. I would definitely love to talk to you. Good. You can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you. Oh yeah, one more thing. I am looking for Norway rat scat. Yes, you've heard me correctly. Norway rat scat. I'm looking to purchase some. Uh, I was very glad to have one individual uh, send uh, sell me some uh, roof rat scat. Very happy to receive that. And one was even kind enough to send me house mouse scat, which I was very pleased with. You say, aren't house mouse everywhere? Well, house mice are in a lot of different places, but remember where I'm based here in Montana. And so we have deer mice primarily rather than house mice out here. Uh, I'm sure we have some house mice, but uh, as, as the person who sent it to me was from Montana, but he was also from a much bigger urbanized area than I am. The town I'm in is only 6,000 people as of the 2020 census. So uh, even though I'm a city boy, I'm out here in the out here in the country to be sure. And so it's definitely a different experience. All right. Well, this week I thought I would talk about what I would call isolated birds. 
I hate the title. I don't think it's a very good one. It could be considered specialty issues with birds, but rather than getting hung up on the particular title of the presentation, let me explain what the issue is with these particular birds. I want you to consider about a client who's having trouble with birds, perhaps scaring clients. For example, or their customers, that per se. Consider for a moment, let's say birds are inside of a, constantly going into a trash can. And when customers walk by, they get spooked by that bird. Or they get frightened and you're afraid that someone might fall. You may have issues where there are excessive droppings in an area that could potentially cause slip and fall hazards. Maybe there is a, a bush nearby where birds like to reside in and as people walk by, the birds get spooked and then the client, or the customer gets scared. How are you to deal with that? Because you're dealing obviously with a rather public area. You're dealing with the business, having issues with clients. Uh, you may have a client where they are not allowed to perform even lethal control and they're very hesitant about doing anything that could be perceived by the animal rights protest industry as harming those birds. So even when, even if you're in a situation where it's legal to do lethal control per se, the client may not even allow you. So how do you help this particular client resolve the problem. Now, I am not claiming for one minute that this is a significant problem throughout the United States or elsewhere. What I'm saying is, though, that this is an issue that can certainly may come up uh, for some of you, or maybe maybe you'll never encounter it, right? Or maybe you haven't even thought about it. So, this is something we want to. I wanted to talk about today. So. Some of you may already be familiar with this little guy, Canada geese, right? Now, Canada geese obviously can create slip hazards. You may be aware of Canada geese that are in a nesting situation and people are, they're, they're nesting close to a walkway, perhaps nesting to a doorway, and then all of a sudden, uh, people are walking by, they don't know the goose is there, and all of a sudden, this goose comes out at them and you know a goose is a fairly big a fairly big bird and they throw their wings out there and they become quite aggressive and people can be extraordinarily frightened you may have even have heard stories of people getting you know chased by turkeys i think there was a viral video a few years ago where a, a postmaster was getting chased by turkeys and this can be very dangerous because for some people and you know we're we're an aging population in the United States. Uh, people have different levels of bone density. They have different levels of athleticism. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're slipping, falling, something gets broken, right? And now you have this injury that's, that's there. And of course, perhaps the specter of a lawsuit. So this is a uh, it can be a big it can be a big issue and even if there is no lawsuit right uh, i'm no lawyer i'm not claiming to be a lawyer and i'm just simply saying that these are you know you can be sued even if you know you haven't done anything wrong right it's just part of what america is but does the cus does the business want to hassle right so how do we as wildlife control operators now respond to the issues that the client is having with these what I call isolated birds or birds that show aggression or birds that are in a situation where they're creating a fright risk or a fall risk. Look at the feces on this walkway. You say, oh, Stephen, come on, what's the big deal? It's all level and everything. And I would agree. Now, for me, other than the unsightliness of it, uh, it wouldn't necessarily be a big deal. However, it could be a problem for someone who is in a private property rather than in a public access area, right? I mean, because it's pretty hard to sue a city per se. But what happens if this was owned by, you know, maybe a cemetery? Or maybe it was owned by a company that serviced 
uh, weddings and celebratory events and that sort of thing. So you can see how we're throwing in this sort of legal aspect to it, but it's bigger than that, of course. So how do we deal with these types of situations? Well, the first thing I want you to remember, again, I'm talking from an American context, but I would, I would think that for many of the listeners that I have here, chances are you have a nation that also has restrictions on the, the killing of birds. So the North American Migratory Bird Treaty Act covers Mexico, it covers the United States, Canada, I believe there's elements of it for Russia, and even Japan. So that's a pretty big area, but I would think that those of you who listen, I, I know that there's people that listen out of Australia, uh, I would think that Australia has similar type laws that there are certain things you can't do with protected species of birds. In other words, they're, they're non-invasive, right? So that's your first, you've got to figure that out. Is this bird situation a protected bird or is it an unprotected bird? And so I have some websites here. Uh, and so let me just sort of uh, click this one uh, for you just so that you can see it. And I want to just sort of put this out. Now, this is the Federal Register. This kind of becomes part of an official document here. And you'll notice that this actually, you can do it as a print PDF if you wish. It was done in 2005. And I believe the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service also has a, uh, a page of their own here. But this is the official document. And it basically lists for you. It's a lot of reading yeah, if you want to go through it. I'm trying to scroll down to where the list is. And so the following 14 species were overlooked in the notice of January 4th, but there is substantial evidence of non-native human introduced. Let me just sort of highlight this here for you so you know where I'm reading. Uh, human introduced occurrence in the United States in this terrace. So we add them to the final list. The authorities upon which these determined terminations are based are noted parenthetically. Because again, Remember what the North American Migratory Bird Treaty Act requires. It only protects birds that are native to the United States. If the bird is not native to the United States, it is not. it does not get protection from the North American Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Now, it may have other protections, but as far as this Migratory Bird Treaty Act is concerned, it is not protected. And so typically, as wildlife control operators, we just focus on three, perhaps four. If you're in the south, you may have Muscovy duck situations thrown in, so maybe five. But typically, it's your house sparrow, your rock dove or pigeon, common pigeon, or your European starling. But there's also Eurasian collared dove. Okay, so those are the four, the, the big four as we call them. For those of you in the south, you may have Muscovy ducks as part of that mix as well. But nevertheless, the, these are some additional birds that are on here. But chances are, it's going to be pretty hard for you, you know, they're not going to be very common. But nevertheless, you need to check this sort of list here to find out whether the bird is on the unprotected list. Now, if you're saying, Stephen, I don't want to do that, there's another way you can go about it, and that is you just go to the protected list, okay? So you can skin this cat in two different ways. I would suggest you maybe go to the protected list and make sure that the bird's not on it, right? And then go to the unprotected list to see if it's on there. I, I would encourage my audience, this is something you don't want to screw up. Okay, so you want to be sure that you have confirmed both positively and negatively that you're not dealing with a protected bird. So you would want to check the protected list. And if it's not there, you need to find that species on the unprotected list. Or maybe you need to question whether you have identified the bird correctly. Okay, so get your ducks in a row. Uh, you know what a pun that is, and here we're talking about birds, right? But make sure you have got a positive ID. Photographs can be very helpful here when you're doing bird work. You really want to get photos. You need to be photographing the site, 
that helps you with counts and what kind of damage is occurring so you have the documentation that paper trail that can be very helpful for you okay so here we go with another this document here i believe it's an excel spreadsheet you can download this particular document and do a search for the particular bird that you're looking for it'll have the species stuff in here so it's pretty it's pretty neat right so there should be no reason for a wildlife control operator professional and i trust that all of you want to be professionals and you want to grow in your professionalism there should be no reason for a professional not to know whether this bird's protected at the federal level okay i want to be very clear about that we're talking about the federal level there may be protections for birds at the state level chances are there won't be however i things change you know this podcast may be out for a while things may change late legally so this is what the process is now as of I'm as I'm recording this but nevertheless states have the right to go beyond federal restrictions and add additional restrictions right they can't loosen federal law but they can make federal law even tighter if they so choose and so you need to make sure that there's no state or local restrictions on the management of that bird if it's unprotected at the federal level all right so let me we're going to talk a little bit more about that so in a moment here so make sure you know what you're dealing with before you do anything you're going to regret so let's deal with the question step by step from the federal level okay so our first question when we're dealing with a bird problem for a client our first question is the bird protected or is it not protected if it is protected the next question is is it an eagle Eagles in the United States have extra special protection. What does that mean? Well, when we're dealing with eagles, you can't even harass an eagle. Harassing an eagle is a violation of federal law. You say, well, Stephen, I'm not harming the eagle, and that doesn't matter. Uh, the eagle is protected above and beyond all other birds in the united states okay so you can't even harass those things right so you say you know it's basically treated as a threatened or endangered species okay so you don't want to be dealing with that right so if it's an eagle then you need to be getting help from the u.s fish and wildlife service if you're dealing with a situation of an endangered or threatened bird and, and again highly unlikely right however for those for that zero 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 one percent that's point zero 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 one percent of the time when you might be dealing with a protected bird uh you need to be contacting the u.s fish and wildlife service before you do anything i mean and, and i mean anything unless you are rescuing the bird from imminent death okay uh, i do think that i don't think the u.s fish and wildlife service will prosecute you if you're trying to rescue a bird from that's endangered or threatened from imminent death although you need to be understand that you're handling that bird uh can be considered a violation of federal law it's when you read the statute it is pretty broad even owning a feather of a protected species is a violation of federal law Okay, whether it's protected or not, whether it's uh, endangered or not, right? So make sure you know what you're doing because if something goes wrong, you're going to be in trouble. So I'd be making some phone calls before I do anything, okay? And you should have those numbers in your cell phone. So make sure you have a phone number for the regional office that governs your particular state. It's all available online and have that you need to have all of your workers have that information maybe i should do a podcast on phone numbers you need to have in your phone book and maybe i'll make a note of that right now um contacts in your in your phone and i think i'll do a pre presentation on that because i think it's important that everyone on your team knows who they're supposed to call obviously call them the owner but sometimes you don't you as the owner you really can't do anything and you need to have your people calling federal help as soon as possible okay so if it's if it's an eagle all bets are off you need to contact the u.s fish and wildlife service of course chances are it won't be an eagle okay but if it is you got to contact them 
So if you ask the question and you said the answer is no, that the bird is not protected, now you need to ask the next question, is it protected by any state or local laws or regulations? Chances are it won't be, but you need to check just to make sure because there may be situations where the state has put it on its endangered or threatened or protected list because of it's become a species of concern for that state. So you need to be sure that you know what you're dealing with there. And again, positive ID is absolutely critical. If you say it's, if you say yes, it is protected, no, it is not an eagle, and it's not an endangered and threatened species as well. Okay, let me throw that in there as well. Then you need to, you can start performing non-lethal controls. Now, I, as those of you know, my podcast, I hate that phrase. Unfortunately, it has become so embedded in our culture, even among academics, it's very hard to jackhammer that phrase out. I did a publication on why I think that phrase is really a misnomer in many ways. Nevertheless, what we're meaning here is that you're not doing anything to directly harm the bird. Like you're not shooting it, you're not hitting it, but you are scaring the bird, you're not, but you're not touching the bird, right? So you can sometimes spray water at a bird in a way that doesn't, that causes it to frighten it away. You can do frightening type devices. You may be able to use repellents on certain situations for the bird, depending on the label. So you are able to do some of these other things. You're able to exclude the bird. Those things you are allowed to do. So, and that can be helpful and many times that will solve the problem or at least give the client a certain level of relief. So let's go into a little bit more detail. What happens if you need to kill this bird? You're like, okay, Stephen, we're in a situation, we've, we've tried some of the non-lethal techniques. It is not happening. So you're already at step one. How do we get to the process where we can kill it? Well, the next step is gonna be, you're gonna contact the US Department of Agriculture Wildlife Services, that's an agency underneath the Department of the United States Department of Agriculture. You contact them and tell them about the problem. Now here's the issue. You're gonna be acting as the agent for your client, right? But the permit, if they grant you one, will be written for the client and you will be listed as an agent. The client needs to understand that they are ultimately responsible for that permit. Okay, so that's going to be important for them to understand. So the USDA and Wildlife Services individuals are going to sometimes talk to you on the phone. They may do a site visit, but they are going to determine whether they're going to give you a Form 37. A Form 37 means that they've evaluated your situation and they've determined that Non-lethal control is not going to be effective here. You need to take it up a notch and you need to go to lethal control. They've Basically, it's your pass to apply. Now, you will then take that Form 37. You will fill out the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service bird depredation permit. Add $100 to it. Submit it to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and pray that they get back to you quickly okay there is no guarantee that you will get the permit so your client needs to understand that that hundred dollars is at risk and so when I talk to people I tell them look make sure you write up this permit and document it in such a way that you are basically trying to prove to the US Fish and Wildlife Service that this bird or birds need to die that's pretty big, right? So this is something, make the case. And so a lot of people don't believe in death penalty. Same thing happens with birds. They don't believe in death penalty. So you need to make the case that this bird needs to die. Okay, that's how I phrase it. It's not, uh, I try to really drive this point home so that people 
document because we hate doing paperwork. This is one of those things you got to have your have your information around photographs, timeline can all be very important to build your case so that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service says, yeah, this bird needs to go. Okay. If they grant you the permit, you then need to find out if there is a state permit that's required. Many states, not all, many states will require you to get a permit. And oftentimes, if you have the federal permit, they just hand it to hand you the state permit, but they may not, or they may add additional restrictions, right? They have every right to do that. So it may be helpful for you as a wildlife control operator to make some of these calls before you ever need to do it, right? Ask the state that you're working in, what do what is your policy regarding bird depredation permits? In some states will say, we don't require a permit if you have the federal permit, you're good to go. Other states will say, yeah, we want to see the federal permit and then we will automatically grant you a state permit because you have the federal permit. Other states may do something even different than that. I would love to get feedback from you on that. I think this is a fascinating area. If you get your state permit and you don't, or you don't need it, then you go the last step that is you perform the controls submit your reports yes there are, is report making when you use a depredation permit you must tell the u.s fish and wildlife service what birds and what you did underneath that permit and and, and submit it to them you have to then if you want need to renew that there's going to be another fee for that in the following year and oftentimes there's going to be a limit to how long you can use this permit so they could be 30 day permits okay so depending on the situation you might get longer it may agricultural areas may get longer permits but if you're dealing just with a structure you may only get 30 days so when that permit comes in the mail you need to make sure are the dates workable right if you, you don't want to have a permit coming in on on march 1st when uh but it's dated it to end on February 28th, right? Well, that's you're know, like, well, it took so long to get me, then you need to make some phone calls. So make sure you check all that material before you move forward with that to make sure everything, all your ducks in a row. Again, I trust you're charging for this. All right, well, let's assume the situation you're dealing with is a protected bird, or not even, it may not be protected, but you wanna say, what are the, some of the non-lethal controls? What are some things that we can do to help our client deal with these birds that may be scaring people or causing slip hazards? Uh, but what can we? what are some things that we can do? And I just wanna throw out some ideas for you. And this is again, we're starting from low to increasing levels of severity in terms of this job. So the first thing, of course, is do nothing. We could just simply tolerate it, think and let it go away. We could ask the client to start working on food. For example, if you're dealing with a restaurant area, there's always going to be food dropping. It may be very hard for them to control that, but what you want your client to do, or maybe you're dealing with a client where there's a worker uh, dinner area or lunch area where they got into the habit of feeding the birds. It's for sort of a form of entertainment. You need to start getting them to start saying, look, the, your workers need to stop feeding the birds, putting up signage, having punishments, and especially if you're dealing with customers, then having signs, please do not feed the birds. Okay, and that can be, that can be one way. And, I, and I'm gonna encourage you to do that regardless of whether you're applying other methods, because again, when you're dealing with, with habitat modification and, and food reduction, that alone can magnify the effectiveness of other forms of technique. Making sure that trash cans are covered and dumpsters are constantly closed. Those are all very, very important. Next thing is maybe you want a fence. Maybe you can't do anything with this particular bird, but maybe you can put up a fence that makes it harder for the bird to get to the people or the people to get too close to the bird. Like for, let's take, for example, you have a Canada goose and it's nested too close to maybe a back door or a front door and it's harassing people. You may need to install a, a fence that may be, may be solid or maybe with a mesh so that when the bird tries to attack, it's gonna hit 
the fence and at least not hit people. And then, of course, you can have signage up saying, please stay away from the bird, right? Avoid, do not, there's a kind of the goose here, please do not disturb it. So now you can awaken people's consciousness toward an awareness of this so that they know that something is there and they don't get surprised by it, okay? You can cut branches. So sometimes birds may be in a well-covered bush and that bush may be very close to the sidewalk. People are walking by, the birds get scared and fly out scaring people. Well, you can cut some of the branches in there, open up that canopy that makes it less attractive to the birds to be there. And that can certainly be helpful. You can take it up a notch and net the tree. So you're like, okay, now remember, you can't, you can't do this if the birds are nesting, right? So if it's a protected species, you can't do this when the birds are nesting because that'll obviously kill the birds or kill the young. But you can uh, net the tree and prevent the birds from getting in or out, right? So this is netting the tree. You can also employ frightening devices where you're sort of harassing them in an aggressive manner. And so, you know, whether you consider frightening more severe than netting the tree, I could probably be switched on, on that. You know, but again, this is sort of a, an idea. You're kind of ramping, ramping things up. And then, of course, lastly, you could remove the tree or the bush. You can't have birds roosting in a tree. Let's say they're drop, putting a lot of droppings down on the sidewalk, causing a slip hazard. You could simply cut the tree down. That solves it. Now, it's pretty drastic, right? So, but it is an option. And again, all of these particular techniques do not are, are non-lethal, provided you're not dealing with young and eggs. But you can see that there are options. Now, they may not be pleasant options, right? But maybe people sometimes just need to drink their castor oil, as they used to say. You don't just need to take your medicine, pump it down. But this is something, at least it gives you some ideas to think about. Always consider that your nesting birds or chicks may demand that you wait to implement certain techniques. There, you not you can never you sh you should not can never you should never harass birds in when they're nesting. I mean, nesting on top of eggs or young that is just downright cruel and it's ineffective. Okay, so don't do it. You have to wait. A lot of these birds they'll they'll, they'll hatch relatively quickly and then they'll fledge relatively quickly after that. You just sometimes just have to tell your client they've got to suck it up and wait. Okay. But this also means that you and your salespeople need to be, when you're seeing problems, you need to be telling your clients, you know, if you wait, sometimes you're going to have to wait even longer than you want to, right? So this is because the time to move is before the nesting occurs. Now, this last question is something I, I wish I had a better answer for. I don't, I'm throwing it out to you for something you, for you to think about, perhaps something for you to talk to your attorney. Perhaps you can talk to your insurance agent. I would love to get feedback from you on this. Again, I'm not an attorney, but what is the level of liability that our clients have to eliminate hazards from free ranging animals? I, and I don't know the answer to that, okay? So, and, and I would suspect it might depend. Um, I don't know. But this obviously could be something that we need to be sure that we raise the question for our clients, not to scare them per se, but we need to give them all the evidence and all the information and say, you know, uh, if, if someone should fall, they're Maybe a lawsuit. It may not go anywhere. You may not. Win. The person may not win, but there may be. It may not be a hazard. Maybe the headlines will be bad for you. Who knows? But it's something to think about because once it becomes an awareness, once the once the owner becomes aware of it, then things kind of ratchet up a little bit, right? Maybe maybe a sign needs to be put up, 
But I don't know, but these are questions that you may want to be sure you have your client think about while they're determining whether to move forward on any type of control. And again, if some of you have had experience in this particular area, I would love to hear from you because I think it's an area of perhaps growth for our industry. I'm not sure this is the kind of growth that we want per se, but you know, it is what it is. And we certainly don't want people being harmed by, by inaction, especially when some small things could be, could be done and that we could do them to alleviate and prevent pain and suffering on the part of clients and their customers as well. So something for you to think about. Well, thanks for listening today. I'm glad you uh, joined us. I hope you found that, uh, even though it's a rather arcane subject, something that's probably not going to make you a ton of money, but some of you out there may be confronting some of these issues and you may get it down the road. Remember, education, sometimes we deal with issues that aren't directly, that we don't think we're going to use right away, right? And so that's what education is all about. I didn't think I'd have to use some of the math that I'm using, right? And I'm like, oh, when am I going to use this? Well, it turns out I wish I did learn more math because I really could have used it. Same way with this. And I hope you would take it in that particular spirit because you never know when these things are going to jump up. Of course, I'm always looking and full welcoming ideas that you may have for future shows because uh, I'd like to be relevant to you. Otherwise, as I've said before, I'm just going to talk about what interests me. So again, this is Stephen Van Tassel. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife. Do take a few moments of your time, if you would, to subscribe to the channel. Join us on Facebook. Join the revolution, as Franklin calls it. And uh, we'd love to hear from you there on Facebook with the Pest Geek Podcast family. Uh, and again, this is Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. And what is, why do we call it Living the Wildlife? Well, we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everyone.